Nevers is a huge, sprawling tale, ostensibly about Victorian ladies with superpowers, but as it goes along and more is revealed, you learn that it's about so much more. I think there's some good, good themes that you don't normally see explored in period drama. It's about how they see the world. A part of them breaks or goes quiet for always when the world turns beastly, when we just let it. The environmental issues that come up in our show and the idea of how we treat each other and how we treat our planet are the biggest themes that exist in our world right now and they are the themes that we're having a conversation about within the Nevers sort of sci-fi metaphor for the human condition and I think being touched can be anything from having a disability to being of a different race or a different religion or a different gender and just about being other. We heard about those girls the last few years. They're not right. Neither right nor wrong, being touched is not a defect of character. The touched are people who find themselves with these supernatural abilities all of a sudden one day, and they're generally people who I think feel powerless in their own lives or in Victorian society. My grandmother used to refer to people who suffered any form of slight mental instability as touched, so it was a really clever sort of adoption of that word to describe these people who are just slightly off normal, eccentric, outside the sort of normal circle of human experience. The fact that they don't have power. Stripe has been the origin of Amalia. When we first meet her, she's in the year 2121, and she is fighting for the dying breaths of Earth and of the human race, and she is pretty much losing that battle. She's been through so much with her PTSD that she's been using morphine where she can to manage her pain. The fact that she jumps into action so quickly is very much as a result of her training in that way. And the PTSD that she suffers from can mean that she will find herself, in fact, most at peace when there is danger present, because in those moments, they're the moments when she can feel calm. I am looking for someone to do a special study with at my facility. Malady is as traumatized as Amalia. This notion that she only feels good when there's pain, I think that's something familiar to some sufferers of trauma. And Malady has, I guess, made her peace with it. She seeks out the pain because the power is more important to her, the strength is more important to her than escaping the pain. And what a twisted gift that is. All your pain. Your rage. At some point, it's what you are. Nobody likes Malady because society is scared of her. Malady gives the touched a bad rep. Promise. The doctor's the cause of all my suffering and pain. And then she turns into just the mad wild dog that we all know Malady is. Amy came to our first session having done a lot of research about what Malady's background might be, where she has come from, what sort of things have happened to her. We knew at that stage that she'd been in an asylum and the kind of treatments that she'd had and how that would have affected her physically and how that would have affected her speech. So we, we thought about the electrotherapy and the way that, you know, Malady will have a thought and be speaking one way and then suddenly, whoa, and it's a totally different direction. You want to make a character seem really emotional. Don't give them a glib, beautiful speech. Give them one that's halting and ragged because there's too much emotion for them to say it perfectly. The closer I came, the more I felt I was here for a... And so I, I hope that kind of ragged portrayal, I hope we're making them feel real. I feel why people are drawn to her and why Annie is drawn to her in that I think when you're part of a marginalized group in society, I imagine there does come a point where you think enough is enough and that Malady is very much a character who is not hiding. And I, I think Annie and, and a lot of the other sort of rebel outcasts are drawn to that, are drawn to that unapologetic power 
of, of being yourself and standing up against the society that has shunned you. I killed the devil. I don't think she intends to go there to kill the elite of society en masse, but that's what ends up happening. She wants the world to know her pain, and what better way and what more of a spectacle would there be to, to do it in front of the high society of London? Is no one going to say thank you? I think Annie realises, hanging out with Malady, that this isn't going anywhere. We're just being destructive for destructive sake, and she doesn't quite understand the journey that Malady's now going on. Annie goes through a change, and, and she turns up at the orphanage. Parley. It was a real sort of shift for Annie within how she obviously viewed the world and how much she wanted to participate and be a team player. Before that, most people were terrified of her. And then now she's here, not only is she here, but she's offering an olive branch of sorts. Unity turns. Chaos is not change. There's a harmony to our world that's worth preserving. As I understand it, a harmony is made up of different voices sounding different notes. Yes. And one is always above the other. Lord Masson, the way things are, should be a very patriarchal model as it was before. And, and the problem, the real problem, is that these women and disenfranchised men who are touched around London represent something very unsettling to the social model. He's concerned with the social model remaining exactly as it was, whatever it takes to do that, whether that is targeted assassinations or deals with people he wouldn't necessarily have anything to do with. What the fuck do you want? I want London under control, not overrun by monsters. Monsters, yeah? The thing that threatens the natural order is by definition monstrous, even if it's pretty. We have Masson, who's sort of the empire embodied. He's the old male white aristocracy and government of empire, and he's very much against women having powers. The first time that Amalia meets Masson is at the opera, and he makes it clear that he doesn't believe that the touched represent progress of any good kind. Shouting for recognition does not make a people worthy of it. Pip Torrens is the master of sinister establishment, and he, he certainly nails it with Lord Masson. He is empire first. On the other hand, the worst thing that can happen to anyone has happened to him, which is he lost his wife young, and now he lost his daughter. The idea of him as a villain, you have to set off against what's happened to him. How did he become a villain? We always ask that of ourselves about villains. How did they get to be like this? There's a regular power play between Masson and Amalia. He's the old power. I guess she represents the new power, and neither one of them is going to give that up easily. So we're at war. Amalia and Masson are wonderful when they go head to head because they're both soldiers. He is a soldier from the past, and she is a soldier from the future who was fighting against rigid thinkers, people without open minds. Change is too scary, even for the people who fight for it. The Galanthi, as we come to know them, have come obviously to help us, to try and wake us up and help us understand what's at stake. And they've been trying to communicate with us. All of the dreadful ways that we have been treating our planet and treating each other have all come to bear. There is a war over the prospect of a helpful alien species who is going to come save mankind from itself and which many people don't want to let into their brains. They don't want help from a benevolent alien, no matter how benevolent, and they are willing to take the whole species down rather than let it be helped. The Free Life Army have been charged with seeking and destroying the Galanthi because they are problematic in terms of their messaging and they're probably frightening external influence on humans. And if they start to awaken people or alter them in some way, then that's something that the Free Life Party would not be able to control. And the PDC believes that perhaps we can learn from the Galanthi and we're doing our best to protect them. And the PDC's job is to try and find and locate these remaining Galanthi and protect them at all costs. It's the fear of change, really. 
isn't it? And the fear of what's different that makes them so intimidating. They have power and, you know, anybody with power creates fear. It turns out that nothing will crack this world harder than one gentle question. So yes, I hope. I truly believe that the more different a society is, I, I believe the healthier it is. The more we can all be milling around with our differences, our different foods, religions, sexual preferences, skin colors, heights, whatever it is, I believe that's the key. Frank. I think Mary and Frank's relationship is pretty complicated. There's a lot of love there, but they realize that they can't be together. They were due to get married. It becomes clear that Mary has somewhat jilted him at the altar, but it's because he's really not being true to himself. It turns out that it's to do with Frank's sexuality. Did she realize she could never give you what you wanted? Or did she find out I was? Finding Hugo an amoral snob, but constantly drawn to him in spite of himself, an attraction that he finds incredibly confusing. So he's absolutely torn and in a complete mess about it. Hugo couldn't care less. He's a bohemian, total free spirit. Frank's the opposite. And at some point in the past, they have had a moment together, and it obviously meant an enormous amount to them both. Hugo is able to talk about it and celebrate its meaning and its value, whereas Frank runs away from that. So you have this wonderful conflict between two men who have very different attitudes and relationships with their own sexuality, but ultimately love each other. I think that's incredibly sad, but also such a nice point to be touching on in terms of making the series current and also taking it out of its period drama into a more modern phase. I was drunk! You were drunk the first time. There is redemption, there is hope in our story, but there's also loss and guilt. I hope that when we're telling the story, it feels real, but it's also clear there are lessons. They're just not tidy lessons. Every single one of them have weaknesses, and it turns out that when they come together, those you know, so-called weaknesses actually work to be strengths. Now, I think the cultural relevance of the show is holding up a mirror to society. I hope that people feel inspired by watching a group of misfits or marginalised members of society standing up for themselves. Gentlemen. I hope it makes them think about what makes a healthy society. It's time to tell them. Everything. <laughs>